Now it's just a matter of drawing out your reins with a taper. And once you get to the point where you're, you can't really go any further, you can go back, cut that in half. You might have to do a little convenience bend to get them into a coal forge. Uh, if you have a propane forge um, and, and it opens from both ends, you can probably stick the whole thing in there without a convenience bend, convenience bend but cut it in half. Continue to draw down your reins. You want them springy. It's easier to hold on to them. So take them down to about a quarter inch. And once you have one set down, uh, one way to measure where you were is put the boss up against the, the table or the step of your anvil and make a mark on the um, far side of your anvil. And then as you taper your other side, you can, you can use that as a measurement to see how you're doing. So this is just a little summary side slide. You, you're gonna draw your reins out to the long taper, but don't forget to chamber in the edges and make sure that the boss is the widest part. The reins shouldn't be wider than the boss. So now you're ready to fit them together. And you can see that this is fairly straight, but we've got a little dip here. And that needs to be straightened out before you fit them together. So if you just follow back through your steps of setting the jaw, then the boss, then the rein transition, and make sure all this is straight, you can easily correct this before moving on to riveting them together. If you do need to adjust the boss, um, you can put a pin drift or something in there to protect that rivet hole, or if you drilled it, the drilled hole. Now we're ready to rivet them together. Um, Miguel, can you tell me how uh, Virtual Mark is doing? Because this is another one with him in it, or should I just talk through? Uh, let's go for it. What's up? Let's go for it. Let's try it. Okay, here we go. Mark's back. When we're looking at the length of the rivet, we know that boss are each three eighths of an inch thick. So we have three quarters of an inch here. I have a spacer block that's about five eighths of an inch thick. The spacer block will allow one end of the rivet to hang while I rivet the other end through. So I need twice the length of the, or twice the height of the spacer block. So an inch and a quarter for the spacer block plus three quarters of an inch here for a two inch rivet. Let's see what we can do here. I'm just gonna pop my rivet in. Is that. And there I am ready to go. Now when I rivet, I'm going to cradle the bottom rein. I'm going to put all my pressure on the top rein. You notice I'm sort of pushing with my thumb here. And what I don't want is a gap between the two because I'll spread the rivet between the gaps. I'm pushing down with the top. I'm going to drive this side down, not all the way. I'm just going to get it enough so it's fixed. Then I'm going to turn it around. And as I'm driving this side down, sorry, this side down, this side will be flattened some more. Before I go into the riveting process, I'm going to come and flare both sides so the rivet won't fall through the tongs in the fire. After I've flared one end of the rivet, I'm going to go to the fire and heat the rivet. I'm going to push the rivet all the way through the tongs. I'm going to put this down in the fire so it gets super hot. The mass of the boss is going to keep the other side of the rivet cool. When I come out of the fire, I'm going to turn it over and drive the cold side of the rivet down till it touches the anvil. And now I can start to set my top rivet. Don't go all the way, just take it down to about halfway and then set the other side. Then address accordingly. Cradling the bottom reins, putting pressure on the top. And 
And now we're going to go and adjust the jaws. The diameter of the rivet shouldn't be more than two times the length for that side. So if you have the, the spacer block, which kind of gives you that measurement, and you know your boss is 3 eighths, you take both of those times two, that gets you to a two inch length so that the rivet on either side isn't any more than two times that diameter of the rivet size. The smallest would be one time, would, would be just be the diameter. The biggest would be two times the diameter. And you flare the one side, so um, I don't need to read this slide to you, but this will just summarize what we just reviewed in that video. Now we're off to make the final adjustments. If you are gonna follow along with the curriculum, you're gonna want tongs that are to hold, are made to hold this size material. And then when you finish with the reins, they should comfortably fit in your hands. And then we'll talk about finishing off the ends. So to set the jaws, you'll use a spacer block. That's the size you want. Initially put that all the way back to the root of the jaw, hammer that in place and go gently as you go. Things can get a little twisty here if you move too fast. Always remember that spacer block is very hot and Mark is, we got virtual Mark coming back in a second. He'll tell us that again, but I think that can't be repeated enough. Um, so let's, Listen to what Mark has to say. When you're adjusting the jaws, you're going to be given the spacer block, three quarter by quarter, I believe. The first thing I would do with that is write hot, lest I forget. First thing I'm going to do is align the jaws side to side. I'm going to open the jaws up. See, they've got a little better there. And I'm going to put my piece in the jaws. Get it right to the root. I'm going to close the back and then close the front. Again, make sure that everything is like that. And at this stage, I'll take another heat around the back of the, uh, the boss here on the reins and I'll go to the vise with the spacer in the jaws and adjust the reins. Notice the very small incremental adjustments that are taking place. Um, don't overdo it at this point. Now it's just a matter of rasping those tips even. They were slightly off and that's what Mark was saying there at the end of that. And now you want to heat your whole jaw assembly and quench it. While you're quenching, open and close the jaws. I like to get it started before I hit the water. And then as you're in the water, you're gonna feel them get loose initially, but then tighter, like to the point where you're like, oh, oh shoot, this isn't gonna work. But if you keep moving them open and close, they will start to move freely and then you're, you're, you'll be all set. Finally, we come to the end of the reins and I'm gonna show you how to put a little curly cue on the end, uh, which would accommodate a tong ring. And a tong ring is just a circle that slips over the ends of your reins to hold the tongs shut, making it easier for you to hold your piece. Having one end slightly longer keeps you from fighting that tong ring as you slip it over the edge. So take a, a very short heat to the end and over the edge of the horn, just gonna bend that. You're not forging at this point, so all the blows should be over air. Bend it slightly, um, do the same on the other side, and you'll end up with something like this that'll allow a tong ring to slip on there and hold that in place. So that is 
um, how to make flat jaw tongs. And I see we've got 20 minutes left, so I'm hoping I can get through a couple photos of the box jaw. Um, so I have time for questions, but I did want to show you, you know, tongs are a disposable tool. And here's some of my beat up little tongs of various styles. I made um, these three, um, chain link tongs, some flat jaws, scrolling tongs. This is a little fancier Dennis Dushik or a farrier style tong. And then these are store-bought, probably tool steel should not be quenched. But just wanted to, I, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar, there's all different types of shapes of tongs, but just wanted to uh, put that up there on the screen. So. Any questions or are we ready to talk about the box jaw? Uh, I am aware that we've got about 20 minutes left. Just go for it. <laughs> so box jaw tongs. Um, the jaw is made to fit the job and the box jaw isn't limited to the style that you see here or uh, that I'm going to show you. Uh, the, you could have um, a box on one side and the other, the box could go all the way to the root of the jaw. So kind of the sky's the limit. It all depends on what you want to do with your tongs because they need to be what you need for your particular job. The, the half jaw, this box just being on the end here, allows you to hold the material sideways if you are going to upset it or, or do something that would require you to hold on to it at this angle. So to set down the first part of your box jaw is going to be more of a fullering maneuver, but you are going to be on the near side of the anvil on a rounded edge and you're going to lay off an inch and an eighth the box jaw gets a little thinner on the edge and you're drawing it out to the side. So uh, does it need to be any longer than that? And I know I'm only talking about 1 16th of an inch, but if you want these to fit up right uh, without having to do a whole lot of rasping, the 1 and 1 8 inch uh, to start is going to be helpful. In order to drop this down because this is being held, you know, almost at a 45 uh, degree angle to the ground. You want to bend your knees and not bend at the back. Um, bending at the knees puts your hammering blows in the correct alignment and uh, allows you to put that fullering shape in there. If that doesn't work, bending at the knees doesn't work, you can use a fuller. Just remember you got to move on to the next step before you set the boss and the rain transition or this little bit of business will get in your way. So we're on the near side of the anvil and now we've turned the piece all the way over and we're going to get our box started for our box jaw. Bring it out so that you're making a square. So out three quarters of an inch, make a square and then set a shoulder. Don't overdo it at this point. You want this part to remain fairly stout as you move forward, but do keep it straight and keep this square. You can correct for some growth and width at this point, but when you turn it, 90 degrees away from your hammer hand to set down your boss, um, you will get, you will be addressing some of that growth in width with just hitting it at this side. It also will give you a little extra here if you don't correct before you move on to this piece. Uh, be very careful at this point that you know where your initial shoulder is or you'll get yourself confused. And, and if you're ever lost, start right at the beginning and then move that 90 degrees away from the hammer hand. Here we are setting our boss. Nothing's different here. And here's that picture I promised about going 
to set the, the rain transition in place, we've moved it again 90 degrees away from your hammer hand, but this time the photo is from the other side and you can see the, the shoulder here that you set by having this at that 45 degree angle. And this measurement to this is that 7 eighths of an inch. Correcting for growth um, and the sides because you want your boss to be nice and even. Dress your boss just like we did last time. Again, don't overdo it. Cycle through the steps and keep that boss at a stout 3 eighths of an inch. Now we get into setting up our boss. And the first step is to fuller a groove into the top of the box. This is set back down on the first step where you see your initial shoulder here and you're protecting the shoulder, but you're getting a groove in there. You're then gonna draw out one side, whoops, the far side and then the near side with a cross peen. I like to use a nice fat cross peen at this point as you move this material out. And keep in mind, you don't need much of a flap, like an eighth of an inch will hold your metal in place. So no need to get overzealous here and try to keep this material, this part of your jaw as thick as possible. If, if you'll notice, you end up with kind of a ridge here as you fuller that out or as you cross peen that out. Um, this can create a cold shunt if you don't use the flat side of your hammer to make sure this is all flat as you go along. You should end up with this hammer head shark, shark kind of look as you go uh, forward. And set these flaps down because that'll be the start of our square corner. This is the bottom of the jaw and fullering in this little bit with your cross peen. Sometimes I'll move to a, a skinnier cross peen or you could even use a handheld fuller at this part holding on to uh, this material um, some other way probably between your legs. Thin this so this is a uniform thickness. Don't really need a taper in this uh, part of the flap that's going to come up to make your box. Keep this square. You can correct for the, the stretching that happened as you fullered that and drew that out by putting it over not a sharp side, but not a round, round side of your anvil and just hitting it uh, with that, you know, your hammer leg is up against the anvil and you've got your hammer vertical so that you bring this in a little bit and that'll help set these shoulders to square as well. Now you're ready to bring in the sides and the best way to do that is with this little tool. You could use the step of your anvil. It can all happen on your anvil, but you are going to end up gouging up some of the inside of that boss. Might not be a big deal, but this handy little tool is nothing more than angle iron with um, a round bar cut in half, welded to the inside, and then the, the box jaw size that you're going for welded on the other side so that when it sits in the anvil, this is, excuse me, when it sits in the post vise, this is the angle iron here. This is that welded on piece. And right under here is that half round bit of business. That half round allows this to swivel in the post vise so that you can accommodate that wedge as you use a set tool to softly bend that over. If you are going to want a much narrower inside edge. You would leave this at a 90 degree angle and, and push this, uh, forge this in so that the jaws are actually uh, flat 
um, this is a little wider than a 90 degree angle so that you can forge these in on the anvil or if you want the wider leave them out like so um, and I see you came up for a question Miguel let me get through the next two slides and then we'll ask questions then you're just going to use your material to set your jaws in place here's one for a little wider material here's a jaw that had it forged down leaving that box open wider than 90 degrees till you were ready to set this all in place and then this adjustment is hitting the top and then over to the far edge, holding this at an angle so that you can set the tips. So here's a pair of tongs I made uh, this week to get ready for this talk. Um, and now we're, well, what I wanted to point out is these um, reins are a little longer, a little springier, and these are much more comfortable in my hand. They work the same as that first pair of tongs I showed you, but this little springier bit of business with the smaller reins does, uh, is more comfortable in my hands. So there, I've got time to spare. We have seven minutes. <laughs> and what's the question? Um, oh. uh, well, I, maybe I'll leave this up for now in case I need to go back a couple slides. Well, leave it up there for now. So, um, so real quick, so you're looking at- oh, I can't hear you, hang on. I turned the volume way down, start over. Right, so looking at, at your uh, particular pair of tongs you're showing here, um, are the reins too close so you can get a good grip? Or are you going to you know, potentially pinch your fingers? No, when the, when the, um, this is for a one inch by half inch stock. Mm -hmm. I made these really big so that when that half inch is in there, they come out to about here. But when no, no stock is in there, I almost took the picture with the stock in there just to show it. But I did make, I did make sure that they fit my hands comfortably. 